memorabilia there. Uh, hold on to the colors. Our, our theme song for our Wednesday night weather. I love it. Kind of, kind of heavy. Um, some of you might know this red glassed woman. Maybe the red glasses are my signature. Oh, ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. There Someone we go. did comment once, and they were like, "Hey, Jenna, no cold glasses." So I just stop everything I was doing and go and get my glasses. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, but of course, why, why, mm -hmm. why wouldn't one do do such a thing, right? So, mm -hmm. um, we'll give a we'll give a minute to spool up the folk here, shall we say? Let everybody uh, like questions coming in, you guys. Good to oh, see you. Gosh, I mean, there's. We haven't even started and there were questions sitting out there. So that's 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 kind of how we do we do here on the Wednesday night webinar. So and you've done this before because Nick and you uh came in. I was you last week. You were me last week as well. How was that? How did it, it go? It was good. Yeah, good? it was good. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I had Debbie, which you met Debbie. Yes, I did what? actually. A big fan of Debbie, by the way. Debbie. Hi Debbie. Everyone um, here is a big fan of Debbie. I mm -hmm. got so much good feedback about Debbie. Yes. So I had to bring her back. Yeah, no, Debbie's, Debbie's great. And Debbie uh, wants to do some work also with me and, and what I do with OCD Foundation and everything too. So yeah, there's yeah, we'll, we'll be working on energy. something for Debbie. So yeah, absolutely. Great. Adds the Smurfly, as I like to say sometimes. So, mm -hmm. And I'm wearing the Smurf colors today, so I can, I can say that as well too. Um, all right, we're spooling up now. The the numbers are growing as as we sit here and chat. Ooh, thumbs ups are coming even. I, Ooh, it, I got I a heart one. I can't do a. I've got a few hearts. Yeah, I can't do the thumbs up or the heart as the host. You know, we have to we have to rely on everyone else to thumbs up and and heart us. Uh, Jenna, do is we get we anything do. else other than hearts and thumbs up? I uh, boy, uh, you know what? I did get a thumbs down once too. Oh, I, well, I I, wah, wah, I said some challenging things, and I think someone was maybe a little triggered by them. But you yeah, know, maybe I, you like didn't give them reassurance or something. That's that's kind of what it was. Well, uh, you know, I could actually tell you what it was it was uh uh someone was afraid about selling their soul to a a negative higher power and, and you were so, probably like yeah you could <laughs> no no what i said was i invited all negative higher powers to join the webinar and at the end i would offer my soul up to the highest bidder and that that got a thumbs down <laughs> from and then somewhere. suddenly you see the numbers go from like 50 to 20. <laughs> yeah yeah right then drop uh no one showed up so um I I I figured I'm I'm soulless then is what it was because no one no one even showed up for for the entire for the whole experience of what it was so all right well um, fifty good we're there uh, Jenna you've got a little ditty right I have a little ditty yeah a little ditty so let's start so, off with a ditty yeah. and we'll we'll move uh, it's not a p ditty it's just a ditty by the way it's a little yeah. ditty just a little ditty. so yeah super happy to be here with you guys my name is jenna overbaugh full-time therapist here at no cd um i typically do the monday night webinars but dr mcgrath just couldn't keep me away couldn't keep me away You're so here i am on wednesday um so happy to be back but with it being june not only is it my birthday month it's oh, also pride month. Wow. Yes. Lovely. It's pride what, month. What great things. This yeah. Week. So yeah. we really wanted to just take a couple um, quick seconds here uh, during the webinar to make it known that no CD honors all sexual orientations. And we are accepting of all sexual orientations, both as an organization and as far as the members coming in. Um, so we just want to make that known and we want to honor that Pride Month can be difficult, um, especially for people who maybe are experiencing some doubt about their sexual orientation. So, um, you know, we we will accept all those questions. Um, you know, we'll certainly go through them. And if there are any related to Pride Month, then I'm sure you're not alone. So um, can definitely be a source of exposure for people. So we just wanna let that be known that we are accepting of all sexual orientations and identities and we're here for you members and for people who work for no cd as well mm -hmm. too maybe say so. yep absolutely so no cd wednesday night webinar here folks brought to you by no cd a downloadable app you can get on google play or ios you can reach out to us at nocd.com if you're looking for teletherapy we are available for you and we continue to get more and more insurance coverages here in the us and we are also available in australia canada and 
the UK. So please feel free to reach out to us and let us do what we can to assist you with that pesky OCD so that it doesn't have to have a big old influence in your life anymore. Because neither of us want that. We're, we're both shaking our heads vigorously saying, no, 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 no. We have dedicated our lives to trying to, to be just, the boss of this thing that tries to be the boss of you. Yeah, sweep it out under the rug, something like that. You know, just make it go away. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got questions already, Jenna. I, yeah. Here they are. Megan says she has POCD. Can we explain why we get urges that feel like we want to do it? And then how do you stop the desire to keep bringing up the scary uncertainty and asking myself, but would you really? Any tips? Well, I'll go with my usual comment, but I'd love to hear what you say, Jenna, too, which is, it has to feel like you want to do it. It has to feel real or else it wouldn't be diagnosable as OCD, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine OCD that didn't feel real. They would come to you, see you on Zoom, Jenna, and they say, Jenna, I've got this, but it doesn't really bother me. Never. Right, no, no, that, that's not that's not the way that it is. Why? How could it be OCD if it didn't really bother you and if it didn't really feel real or feel like you might want to actually go and do something, right? Yeah. And and what I see here, Megan, what I'm hearing just in this comment is just a lot of doubt, which again, reminds me that this is the doubt disorder. So not only is OCD going to have you doubt these thoughts that you have, not only is OCD going to make you have these awful, horrific, intrusive thoughts about children or whatever the content is, OCD is also going to make you doubt like your, who you are as a person and like, your perception of those thoughts. Did you actually not like that thought? Even though you can really truly not like it by all counts and by all measures, OCD is gonna jump in and say, but did you really not like that enough? Yes, what if I didn't not like it enough? Yeah. I mean, maybe that means that I do like it because I did not like it enough. Yeah, and OCD is always, go it's never gonna be enough for the OCD, right? It's never ever, you're, gonna, you're never gonna be able to hate these thoughts enough. Wow. But OCD tells me that I can hate them enough if I just do it the OCD way. Yep. But, and so, yeah. So what it, what it's going to feel like, Megan, and what it's going to feel like for anyone else out there who's trying to challenge themselves with this is it's going to feel scary. It's going to feel irresponsible. It's going to feel maybe even a little bit perverted, like especially when it comes to this content. And you're going to have to resist answering all those questions. You're going to have to resist and, you know, figuring out 100%, do I really, really, really not like this? Right. Do I really, really, really hate this enough? Because yeah. it's just never going to be enough. I love Dr. McGrath, your um, Charlie Brown and Lucy example. <laughs> I've been using that a lot lately. Okay. Right? All right. And I'm glad you like it. Uh, it hit me one day. It was like, okay, so OCD is kind of like Lucy holding the football, right? And you're Charlie Brown. And Lucy says, I promise this is the time. You're going to kick this football this time. So just come on, Charlie Brown. Come and get it. And every single time that football gets pulled up and Charlie Brown goes flying through the air and yells, ah, and lands on his back. <coughs> right? And even in an interview once with Charles Schultz, he said, Charlie Brown was never going to kick the football. Yep. So... No matter how hard he tried, he was never going to be able to do it. And that's what it's like to live with OCD. OCD says, hey, here's the goal. You can get there. And then parentheses, but by the way, I'm the doubting disorder and you're never actually going to truly make it. Close parentheses, but keep trying. Keep trying to do it anyway, right? So how can you ever feed enough food to the insatiable monster? You, you can't. It's insatiable which means it's never going to have enough. No one with OCD in the history of OCD has ever said, hey, you know what? I finally got enough information and proof. Thanks, I'm good now. We're, we're okay. So I'm going to go. It was nice being in your brain with you for the last 20 years. Thank you for finally giving me enough information to satisfy me and make me feel like now I've gotten all the answers I need. I'm going to let you go. Have a great life. Mm -hmm. Never happened. Never happened. Never going to happen. It's not the way OCD works, right? So the more you try to make it that way, the worse you're going to feel. Mm -hmm. 
And what it seems like too, now that I'm reading it a little bit more is like, there's almost this urge to want to like evoke the thoughts and evoke the images just to check to make sure that you didn't like it. Yeah, right. That would be something that we would want people to resist too. Like I, you know, it seems kind of backwards that you would want to bring up these thoughts to bring them up just to make sure that you don't like them. But I hear that all the time. They want to, they want to almost think about these things just to make sure they don't like it. And that's yeah. definitely, that can definitely be a compulsion. Yeah. Now we'll do that in ERP. We'll have people sit with it, but it's not to get you to not like it yeah. enough or not enough or anything like that. It's to just not care at all. Right. I mean, Jenna, you've got a child. You could think about something horrible happening to your child right now and do no ritual whatsoever and feel no guilt about it whatsoever, mm -hmm. I would bet, correct? Yep. In no. fact, I, this happened to me on my way home from getting him from my to pull over on the side of the road and he had to pee. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And I had this thought, like, what if I just throw him out into traffic? Like, what <laughs> if I just grab him and throw mm -hmm. him into oncoming traffic? Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's not the same content, Megan, but it's the same process, right? It's the same intrusive thought. And there's definitely potential there for me to feel responsible for that thought, to try to control that thought, to just never want to have that thought again, to, you know, have this thought action fusion, right? Like, because I thought that, then somehow I'm going to be more likely to do it. Um, I just kept walking to the other side, walking around and got him buckled up and just kept going on our way. And mm -hmm. I never stopped to, to analyze that thought. I never stopped to give that thought attention. I just kept driving. And so all of those questions were still there. Um, and that's kind of the experience of, of an intrusive thought, really. Like you're, you let it be there. And even though it's, it's kind of this experience of like, I don't know where the heck that came from. Yeah. And then making the deliberate decision to just continue with your normally scheduled programming, despite the pull to go in another direction. Yeah. I got called into court once on a case. Uh, the, there was a divorce and one spouse was trying to say, because the other spouse once had an intrusive thought that they would throw the child into the fireplace, they should not have custody at all of the child and should only have supervised visits with the child. And I was like, well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. First of all, name one parent that hasn't at some point in time having a child thought, I want to just knock you <laughs> in, in the middle of next week, right? Or something like that. Um, I, th those things happen, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guarantee if you go driving with me and you see someone cut me off, I will contemplate ramming my car into that person who cut yeah. me off. It's just going to happen, right? So, um, Carl, who's on here once in a while, one of our uh, no CD advocates, has, has said, uh, we're either the largest gathering on Wednesday nights of murderers and pedophiles and thieves and cheats, or we all have OCD and we're yep. all here gathering, just uh, listening to a webinar about it, right? When you, like you've said before, you know, I would trust my child with someone like that versus a stranger. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. I'd rather give my niece or nephew to someone who has POCD than to someone I don't know. Yeah. Right. Any day. Any mm -hmm. day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Megan says, is it possible for OCD to be a symptom of another issue? And is it often accompanied by other anxiety disorders? Uh, we'll start with the second one first. Yes, it's not surprising to see OCD along with other anxiety issues or mood issues as well, like depression. And in fact, we know this just from the diagnostic um, studies that if you're diagnosed with one thing, you've got about a 45% of having a second diagnosis as well too. So it's not uncommon, uh, number one. And, and number two, is OCD a symptom of another issue? Uh, there are rule outs like is OCD the result of a medical condition or is it the result of a medication or a substance use or something like that. Now, frankly, I can't tell you that I've ever in 21 years diagnosed any one of that, but it is listed in the DSM. Um, we have seen people who have experienced trauma who have developed OCD as a result of the trauma because the OCD now is being seen as something protecting. Maybe one time they got hurt. Now, now they do a lot of obsessive thoughts about what if I were to get harmed by this thing again at some point in time. So that leads to a lot of compulsive behaviors like checking to make sure something bad doesn't happen. So that wouldn't be uncommon. Yeah. And I, I would say that that doesn't necessarily, and it wouldn't change the course of treatment, right? So even if someone does have 
their OCD being maybe exacerbated as a result of a trauma, um, like Dr. McGrath had mentioned, we would still want to apply exposure and response prevention to that scenario. Obviously, we would want to be trauma informed in that case. Um, we would want to know about the totality of the situation. We would want to know kind of how the trauma um, experience affected that and was affected by that. Um, but we would still apply exposure and response prevention, um, even if it was kind of coinciding alongside something else. Yeah. Daily Art Grind. Hello again. Welcome back. Uh, real event OCD and the guilt that it causes has become extreme. Is there a way to deal with this guilt? I'm, I'm unable to just leave things in the past, no matter how insignificant it is. Well, I would take a look at a couple of things. Number one, I don't believe anybody feels something like guilt or shame, unless they're getting something out of it. Now that may sound weird to say, right? But um, maybe the guilt is being used as almost a potential to avoid things in the future to make sure that you do nothing ever again like you've done in the past that has led you to feel guilt. So now the guilt is a constant reminder. Hey, you once did something that now you feel guilty about. We're gonna slam that guilt at you constantly to make sure that you never go back and you ever do that again. Mm -hmm. right? So there's a purpose to that guilt or shame or disgust or anxiety or stress or whatever it is that you might feel with obsessive compulsive disorder. There, there's a purpose to those things. Now, in terms of I'm unable to just leave things in the past no matter how insignificant it is. Do you want to live that way? Do you do things to only live that way? Or have you started to consider doing ERP to focus on things that are going to happen in the right now instead of focusing on things in the past and sit with what's going on in the present or what you would like to do in the future? Or are you ruminating constantly about the past and, and trying to figure out what you did wrong and, and how can you go back in the past and undo it or relive it or something of that nature? Because there's a lot of people who do that, right? Who focus on all of those kinds of things thinking, I've got to figure out a way to undo something that I've done in the past. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think when it comes to these rituals, we have to start first by busting the justifications that we have for them, right? So I think a lot of times when it comes to reviewing old situations, trying to remember, trying to review past events with the intention of trying to remember it perfectly, right? Like our justifications are that if I just remember it, I'll feel better. If I just remember it, then I'll know for sure. If I just remember, then X, Y, Z, right? Like, even if it doesn't feel logical in the outside of that high anxiety state, obviously we're doing it because we know we're getting something out of it, right? There is some justification for it. Um, so I think the first thing that we have to do is just call out those justifications. Like, why are we doing this? Why are we going back? Because I feel like if I remember, then I can move on with the rest of my life. How has that worked out for you? <laughs> right? like, if Not so great, it sounds. Right? Right. Yeah. Let's say that this was a good potential solution to the problem, to sit in your, in your solitude and try to remember it. At some point, we have to like cut it loose, right? Like at some point, we have to come to the understanding that, fine, let's say that that was a good potential solution. We tried that. It's not working. I would ask yourself, are you getting any closer to figuring it out? Probably not. Are you getting any, are you starting to feel any better about that situation? Probably not because research shows that that rumination and that mental reviewing makes you more depressed, more anxious, more uncertain and less confident in your memory. So there was a study once that I love referencing when it comes to reviewing of old things. Um, about the confidence and memory when you give into checking behaviors. And so there was this article um, and I think it was about checking tactile things like faucets and stoves yep. and whatever. Yep. And Absolutely. I know where you're going. But Absolutely. I don't care what you're checking, right? So I don't care whether you're checking the faucet or the light switch or your hair straightener or a past event. The function of the behavior is the same. So I feel like it can extrapolate to real mm -hmm. event OCD for sure. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so this article was essentially that you know, people with OCD, they would go back and as they continue to check things like the light switch, their stove, their door, whatever, they checked it five times, 10 times, 50 times, 100 times. 
you would think that as they increase the number of times that they check this thing, that their confidence in their memory would go up. That just is what common sense says, right? Like I checked something a hundred times, I should be more confident in my memory than if I only checked it once. It's actually an inverse relationship. So as you check things a hundred times, you're way less confident than had you only checked it 90 times, not to mention if you hadn't checked at all. So what I'm trying to say is as soon as you check whatever, including your recollection of past events, you start to sacrifice confidence in your memory. And that brings us back to the basic OCD cycle, which is every time you do that, you are reinforcing this idea that you don't have a reliable memory. So your brain is like, well, I guess daily art grind doesn't understand, doesn't have confidence in their memory. They are going back and trying to remember. So they must not have good memory. So every time you go back and do that, you're setting yourself up for failure for the next time. And so I guess moral of the story is you're only ever going to be as confident as you are in this moment. Mm -hmm. We're probably not based on the research going to be any more confident than that. And it's not a hundred percent. And I know that that's scary. Right. And we need to just kind of cut our losses um, you know, the, if we want any chance of living a happy, fulfilled life. The what ifs, too, about the past are never great. I mean, what if what if I did something that made everyone love me is is never what OCD is going to focus on. It's always what if I did some blank, awful, horrible type of, of thing. You know, uh, it's funny. I, I I was cued into a memory as we were discussing this. So I remember I grew up in a home where stuff on the floor was like a no-no, you know, they, things had, things had their place to be and the floor. That's was, how you ended up here. That maybe, maybe, who knows? but and that's not where they were supposed to be. So I remember being in a store one time with my mom and it happened to be a religious store. My mom was shopping for something and I was a little kid and I was, you know, crawling around on the floor. And on the floor was this little gold pendant. Now I was raised that if something's on the floor, it's it doesn't belong there and it's probably going to get thrown away if if you don't do it. So I figured, well, they must be just throwing this pendant away because it's on the floor. So I took it <laughs> and I put it in my pocket. And so now I'm at home and um, and my my uncle as as this new girlfriend and uh she seems nice so i go and i get this pendant and i i say welcome welcome to our house it's nice to meet you and i and i give her this pendant as a little present so now i've trafficked in stolen goods as as like a five-year-old or a four-year-old so i'm i'm wondering um should I figure out where that store was and what kind of recompense should I make to them? And it was a religious store. Would there be other kind of moral or scrupulous types of issues that go along in this whole experience as well too? Or can I kind of live with the fact that, oh yeah, I had an interesting view of some things as a child from how I was raised about things, but I've kind of grown out of that and I've learned that that's not the way that you do things. You know, how, much, how much do I need to go back and and kind of punish myself and make restitution for something like that, that I've done. And if I, any of you just spend like 10 minutes on any Netflix real documentary on like false confessions, you'll know yeah. that our brains are completely like <laughs> to a fault, very malleable and impressionable. Um, so they've also done research, like if you are asking someone who witnessed a car accident, how fast did that car hit the other car? Yeah. They'll say something like 40 miles an hour. But if you frame it as how fast did that car crash into that other car, there's a significant difference just by using that description, hit versus crash. They'll Someone will say 65 miles an hour, right? Mm -hmm. Memory is the same. They saw the same car crash. But depending on how you describe it, your recollection of it can be a little bit different. And so we yeah. have to accept that our brains are kind of malleable in that way. And we're, we're not going to understand exactly everything that goes on 100%. The same thank you. Way, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth Loftus, for that great research, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So. You're, you're a nerd. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I kind of am a little bit. So. But, hey. We're like 20 minutes in, so. Oh, you have a little intermission? I even have a little intermission.
much. Well, because every 20 minutes or so, I like to remind each other, hey, thank you, Paul Melia, for our wonderful team. But also that this uh, this here webinar being brought to you by No CD. No CD can download mobile app, and uh, please go to nocd.com. And if you're looking for teletherapy, we're available to you in uh, several countries like the US or Canada or the UK or Oz, as they call it, if you're from Australia. So please uh, feel free to go to nocd.com and check us out. And uh, once again, I am uh, Dr. Patrick Breath. I'm Chief Clinical Officer for No CD. And tonight we have with us Jenna Overbaugh, who's just kind of skyrocketing in the no city world. So thank oh, you thanks. for all the work you've done with our support groups, that way. our lives, that way. your Instagrams, and all sorts of things. So uh, that's that's great. You've got like your own little production company going with the Instagram stuff too, don't you? I mean, I don't know how. I don't know how. <laughs> I, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, but it's fun. I think I think yeah. my I think my magic is that I just have fun with. I just have fun. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah. And I you have an Instagram look out. too. Yeah. You have an Instagram look too. Thanks. Which I like. You it's do. The office. Yeah. It's well, office. and and the facial expression you do too, because because a lot of times, you know, you've got the little little thing that pops up. So you'll sit there and be like. I do have a <laughs> I yes. Uh, that's something where I used to work at Rogers. Like anytime that we would be in a meeting, they're like, yeah. We don't even need Jenna, like we don't even need the sound on. We can just tell how the meeting is going by Jenna's facial expressions. So like, it's either <laughs> it's either gonna be really bad or it's gonna be yeah. really good. <laughs> All right, Haley says, why has my OCD changed me in my personality? I no longer have anxiety attacks about things I think will make me a bad person. Good, but I'm not getting better either. I'm just here. Well, I, I challenge that notion that you're not getting better. Not having an anxiety attacks is something that definitely leads you to feel better. And th this phrase, I'm just here. I want to I wanna talk, Jenna, I want to talk to you about that. Um, I would say people without OCD probably have that feeling all the time. I know. Yeah, I'm here. You know that that it might be weird for people who who get treatment for OCD who no longer have that over emotionality that OCD might bring to their life. That that they think, well, I don't I don't know how to feel now. I mean, I, I I'm numb or I just I'm just here. Yeah, maybe welcome to what it's like to not have OCD involved in your life so much. That mm -hmm. that is how people without OCD and maybe anxiety disorders or or depression would tell you they feel. That yeah, I'm I'm here. I'm okay. Yeah, I'm just I'm here. It is what it is. That that people without these conditions or issues don't spend a lot of time thinking about how they feel which might be amazingly foreign to people who do have some of these conditions, who maybe a vast majority of their day is thinking about how they feel. But when you don't have these things, you you just don't think about that. That's just not something that's on your radar whatsoever throughout the day. You just go about your day and do your thing without thinking about how you feel about it. Yeah, one of my favorite non-engagement strategies is being okay with all emotions and still doing whatever it is that you want to do anyway. So Haley, that's kind of what I'm thinking would be great for you, like being okay with whatever emotions you're feeling, whether that's good, bad, in between, whatever, and still doing whatever it is that you want to do anyway. So whatever, you know, whether that's routine activities, paying bills, taking care of your house, walking your dog, enjoyable activities, you know, hanging out with friends, whatever. Um, Again, like I think this is a perfect example, like Dr. McGrath said, where like the I'm just here isn't necessarily the problem. It's your perception of that and your misinterpretation of that being the issue. Like I'm just here. I'm not at one end of the spectrum. I'm not at another end of the spectrum. And that's the problem. Um, but I think, yeah, I've worked with so many people. I, I worked with this big burly man. And he loves watching these things. So if he's watching, he knows who he's who he is. Hello, big burly man. Yes. <laughs> he was awesome. Um, and he started out exposure therapy so strong. And he would have these really like cr like overwhelming episodes of just he was so proud of himself and he like couldn't believe what ERP was doing for him. And he this huge this huge like big teddy bear of a guy would just break down into tears because he was so excited about what ERP was doing to him. Eventually that wore off, as do all extreme emotions. Um, 
bad ones and or negative ones and positive ones. Um, and he was like, I'm doing it, but it just doesn't feel like it felt before. And I'm like, that's just, it's just, it's never going to feel that extreme all the time. It's never going to feel that bad and it's never going to feel that good forever. I think everything always comes back to a good state of balance. Yeah. Um, so Haley, my advice is continue to do the things that it is that you want to do. Like yeah. the expect, the expectation here that you're always going to feel good or that you have to feel different. Um, you don't have to necessarily wait for your feelings to do a certain thing or to, to do a certain, uh, you know, feel a certain way before you do the things that it is that you want to do. Yeah. I can guarantee you this, Jenna. I haven't thought at all about how I felt today until Haley's question came up and it made me think about how I felt. Mm -hmm. Until then, I hadn't thought once yeah. about how I felt today. I think okay. people, I think a lot of people with OCD, they use their feelings as a gatekeeper for what they do. Like, yeah. I don't feel good, so I don't think I can go to that party. Right. I, I feel off today, so I don't think I can be the one to pick up my son from school. And it's like, no, like if we do that, we start to give our feelings so much say, and we, mm -hmm. we're no longer driving the ship. We're no longer driving the car and making those decisions, right? Yeah. I haven't taken a sick day in almost 20 years. Yet there's still days I didn't feel fully myself, you yeah. know, maybe a little cold or something like that. Uh, but I also didn't let that influence me doing therapy with people as well too, right? I mean, it's just one of the things I think that we try to teach people is that it is okay to interact with the world not feeling 100%, not yeah. feeling your best. OCD says that's not possible and you shouldn't do that. You should only be your best at 100%. And by the way, I'd like to point out all the ways that you're not 100% or at your best because I'm OCD and that's what I do because I'm a jackass. But um, you, those of us without OCD or who, who aren't feeling any kind of uh, crisis or condition at this point, that's just not on the radar of, of things to, to experience. So. And I, and I think your personality is going to change, right? I'm of the opinion yeah. that I feel like we're always changing. I'm different than I, I, in a lot of ways, I'm different than I was six months ago. I'm, I'm definitely different than what I was before I had a child, right? Like, instead of uh, but there's never any comparison of that there's never like this is the version of jenna here versus the version of jenna over here and then making that analysis like that would cause me to be very anxious mm -hmm. so and there there's you just have to kind of be along for the ride yeah eliza j says for those with thought action fusion or magical thinking how do we deal with this when manifestation is a popular concept now that says if you think it does if you think things it does cause things them to happen for I, there's an extra them there i'm sorry so let me try that again uh if you think things it does cause them to happen for you well all right ceiling collapse on me ceiling collapse collapsing ceiling uh, i'm thinking of you ceiling please collapse on me please 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 ceiling Please I want to win the lottery. Collapse. I'm going to win the lottery tonight. Ceiling collapse and lottery wins. Lottery will pay for ceiling collapse after ceiling collapses. Right. Guess the manifestation did not occur. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to why the thought action fusion was not real in this instance. Uh, in fact, I have wished for a ceiling to collapse on me now for 21 years in doing all of this and never once has a damn ceiling collapsed on me ever in the 21 years of me using that example. So I think manifestation is crap. All right, I'm just gonna be blatantly honest with you. I think it's bull. I don't think thought action fusion is true or real. There's no such thing as magical thinking, but OCD disagrees with me. OCD says, but what if there is? But what if it happens? But what if it's true? Right? Just give me an example of it being true. That's all I ask. I just ask for one example of it coming true. So that's what I want to see. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't yet found one. How about you, Jenna? Have you ever seen it uh, happen? Yeah. Nope. It's always something bad too, right? Like when we at, when I ask people about the lottery thing, like, okay, think about the lottery or is that going to happen? No, of course not. <laughs> it's like, okay. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, uh, when it comes to this, especially with the negative events, I think what people are afraid of is the responsibility. Like if I had that thought and then it happens, 
then I'm responsible for it somehow, unless I somehow prevent that from happening, right? So that's something that we have to sacrifice too, right? We have to accept the fact that sometimes we, we might be a little bit responsible for some bad things happening, right? Like we may live in this warped universe where we, had we not taken this certain step or had this thought, maybe things would have ended up differently. But I think it comes back to responsibility a lot. Like, because I had that thought, now I feel like I have to do something about it because if that happened, then I would feel awful knowing that I had that thought, I could have stopped it or done something about it, right? Like. We just have to sit with that fear, sit with that uncertainty and try not to get rid of it because that's something too, that magical thinking that can make your world smaller and smaller in a really quick way. Yeah. Still waiting for the ceiling. Here's one of my favorite questions. I'm very worried what people think of me. What would be good ERP? Thank you. Uh, wear the dumbest like hat the in the world and go shopping in it. Wear two different colored socks, wear two left shoes. I Do whatever you can to stand out and then practice not giving a crap about what anybody might think about you. Because here's, and, and I'm gonna be bold about this, here's the narcissistic quality of, of anxiety. You know what that is? Everyone's thinking about me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest with you, when I go out, I frankly don't give a crap about almost anybody else whatsoever. I, I'm very focused on, you know, the podcast that I'm listening to and the shopping that I'm doing. And I, I just frankly don't give a crap about anybody else while I'm shopping. And if I do, it might last for a millisecond or two. And then I go back to whatever I'm doing. And I've never, I don't come home and be like, uh, dear, I'd like to give you a report of all the idiots that I saw and describe all of them so that in case you were to ever run into them, you'll know that they're idiots and they're weird. I, that just that just doesn't happen. But OCD almost makes you into kind of this, this narcissistic quality thing where you think, but well, not just OCD, anxiety can do this too. Social anxiety, we see this as well too, right? Because there's the perfectionism quality that can go with both of them, where you think that Everyone is focused on you and thinking about you. And, and I'd contend nothing could be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. I, so <clears throat> fun fact, fun fact. I, was, I was so anxious as a child. I ate lunch in the bathroom for like four years because mm -hmm. I was terrified of like being around other kids and being like, what if someone made fun of me in the middle of the cafeteria? Now I, I'm doing I throw this. up every day of first grade. Now I'm doing this. I get in front of 87 people uh, talking about really random things. Um, I do it multiple times a week. I am pretty open about things on Instagram. I have a podcast, right? Like I'm, I'm in situations all day, every day where people could think weird things about me. And like, I mean, I do every day. I think weird things about you all the time. I think weird things about myself. Yeah, well, there <laughs> we go. So there, congratulations. Wonderful. And <laughs> the, the realization is you could do all the things, right? Like you could eat by yourself in the bathroom for four years. You could avoid everything. You could say all the right things. You could prepare all your conversations. You could review all your conversations. You could ask all the reassurance in the world. And someone would still probably have negative thoughts about you. Someone probably wouldn't favor you. It's a race that you're just never, ever, 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 ever going to be able to, to win. And Jenna, so there's, there's people surrender. Yeah, there's people who hate you because you're a woman. There's people who hate me because I'm a man. There's people who hate both of us because we're white. There's people who hate both of us because we're, we're married. I mean, you could, there, Right there, there's four reasons why there's people out there in the world who hate us. They don't even know us, and they hate us just for those reasons. There's, you just can't. You just can't win. Like it's at some point, like you, mm -hmm. you're never ever going to know for sure what other people think of you. You're never going to be able to know that for sure. Never. Ever. It's you, just so, never so like I said in the beginning, that. you might as well just have fun. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. might as well just have fun. So wear a big stupid hat and just go out and. Have a good time with it and, and you know, maybe dance on your webinar. Drink your watermelon water or whatever you're doing there. You know, watermelon. Watermelon. I hate melon, by the way. <laughs>
I think melon is one of the things. Me too. That's why I don't eat it. That's why I can't eat it. Oh, all right. There we go. Hang on to your colors, by the way. So, all right, everybody. Uh, welcome once again. Your No City webinar, nocity.com. Dr. Farrell! Dr. Farrell's here? What? Yeah. Oh, wow. Jeez. Man, we got, we got them all coming in. Oh, holy moly. We're going to use this together more often. My God. Do Dr. Farrell's question. Most memorable uh, ERP task. Most memorable, he did yes. Uh, most memorable year he test you've ever had. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I stood a foot from a train tracks for three hours with somebody with their hands on my shoulder behind me who had a fear that they would push people into trains and for three hours told them to push me into every train that came by. Over the course of three hours, nine freight trains came by. So I spent about an hour with a train in front of me in that three hours, a foot away from the trains with them behind me and me yelling at them for an hour to push me into the train. That's probably the most memorable ERP that I've ever done. I don't, mine isn't like, my, the one that comes to mind for me is just like the, the extreme progress that you can see with ERP. I worked with someone who needed to eat all organic everything. Mm -hmm. All organic. Orthorexia all, kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah. All organic, whole foods, everything. So bad that this, she was hospitalized several times. It was bad. It was a bad, bad, bad situation. And a couple of like, it, and it was just frozen. I will never go into Whole Foods without thinking of her again. She was great. Whole Foods, um, all organic chicken thighs, frozen in the frozen section, not even a different brand or anything and all organic frozen green beans. That was her diet for like four years. Wow. Um, we had the best Domino's pizza together. <laughs> and it was incredible. And I think it was like around Halloween too. So we had like Halloween candy and Hershey kisses and we just like totally picked out together and ate all of the things. And that was really memorable just because of how, how much progress you can make with exposure and response prevention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it was, I have chills just even thinking about it. Cool. Uh, Daily Art Grind said, could you throw your podcast link in the uh, <gasps> comments there, maybe? So that'd yes. be great. Mm -hmm. Although I haven't done one in a while. I've been so busy with NoCD. I just love NoCD so much. But I hear someone might want to come on and do an episode with me. Uh, maybe. Yeah, I, I'd be I'd be up for it. Um, let's see. Sean says, how do I handle the this real event you did is different than all the others you've obsessed about so you need to confess this to your girlfriend or she won't know the real you and you're lying jenna does your husband know everything about you and everything you've done i intentionally no. keep things from him <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so um sean how bad is jenna then that that she has not told her husband every single thought that she's had, every behavior she's ever done, every event that she's been involved in. Um, what is she hiding? Dun, 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 dun. Or welcome to uh, regular life there, Sean. That's just the way all of us are. And none of us have told everybody everything about ourselves unless we have OCD and then we feel like we have to. And and frankly, that likely pushes a lot of people away after a while when you're feeling like you must tell them absolutely everything about you that you think and feel all the time. I was gonna say, if I if my husband did that to me, I'd be like, I don't I don't wanna know this. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna know that. Yeah. Yeah. Your your husband may pass, let's say, a woman who's who's quite beautiful and think, Wow, she's gorgeous. You don't. You don't need to know that, do you, Jenna? Do you? Do you have to know that? No, I have. I'm like the queen. I've told you this before. <laughs> I'm like the queen of having crushes on people who aren't yeah. my husband. <laughs> so there you go. Mm -hmm. And he knows this even. So, but even if he didn't know it, that'd be okay too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, this is just. This just goes to show that OCD is such a a horrible salesman. Like. Yeah. No, but this time this product is going to work. You've returned it and it's been faulty like 50,000 times, but this time we're going to send it to you and it's going to work. Like you would never buy that. 
you just have to call out the OCD for what it is. And it's going to feel irresponsible, John. Like it's going to feel bad. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you don't stick and stay consistent with your ritual prevention. Yep. Here's a good one. Transformation OCD. How can I solve this? I think I'm going to turn into the old me who I hated if I do something I did in the past, like rewatch a show or sit in a chair. Now, now, Ren, I'm just going to bet in the past you walked, right? So therefore, if you walk today, you've done that in the past. Why hasn't walking turned you into something or someone that you were in the past? Or breathing. You, or breathing. Yes, you've breathed. You blinking your eyes, blowing your nose, talking, cutting your hair putting on a shoe, pooping, all right? All those things you did when you were also the person that you didn't like, why don't those turn you into the old you? Now, here's what OCD does again, right? It says, oh, yeah, it's okay to do some things that I used to do before, but it's not okay to do other things that I used to do before. Some things I used to do before won't turn me into the old me, but other things I did do before will turn me into the old me. Now, when we say it out loud, it sounds a bit ridiculous, doesn't it? Right. And, you, and you can't let the OCD arbitrarily make ridiculous rules like that. Like, oh, no, I can be afraid of, you know, I'm not allowed to order this food because I used to order this food when I wasn't the way that I wanted to be. But it's okay. I can still wear the same shoes that I used to wear. Like, the OCD, the, again, like the OCD is going to, if you allow it, the OCD is going to take hold and it's going to snowball and snowball and make your world smaller and smaller. And suddenly it's going to be one more thing that you can't do. One more thing that you can't do. Mm -hmm. and, and throughout the experience of ERP, we're going to want you to come to the realization that you can do whatever it is that you want to do. And it's going to be anxiety provoking, but you can get used to that. And you can learn that you can do these things and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be the, the person that you used to be. It, it just means that you're putting your shoes on. It just means that you're ordering that item of food. It doesn't have to mean anything. But what if, Jenna, I put my glasses on with the intent of becoming the old me? That would be great. I'm now the old me. Mm -hmm. And I, so exposures, that's like you would do all, do all the things that the old you used to do. Yeah. Okay. Show yourself that I'm maybe the old, the, those old me thoughts can either be there or they cannot be there, but I'm still going to order the food that I want to do. I'm still yeah. going to put my glasses on, even though it's me. Mm. Oh, the old me ate food too. So does the new you not eat food because the old you ate food? That could make you the old me again if if uh, you eat food again. I mean, there's. Oh, I, I love how OCD creates a, oh, a magical comic cartoon kind of filled world, right? Things that could only happen in comic books and in fantasy television shows or Dungeons and Dragons can happen also in OCD world, right? Like suddenly I can become something that I'm not, which no one else in the world could do, right? But OCD tells me that I could. And then I believe it to be true. I look at that and go, yeah, that seems like a legitimate thought. I should probably spend about several thousand hours thinking about that just to make sure that that doesn't happen. Sounds like a good idea. Mm -hmm. There's a question about medications, but we're going to try to have Jamie come on, our chief medical Ooh, officer. That would be a good so idea. We'll, we'll do. We'll do that. Um, uh, Matuzik said, "I ignored his question. I, I, I got to tell you, just so you all know, this thing jumps around constantly. So uh, if if you feel like I've ignored your question, I apologize, uh, but." This sometimes, let's see if I can find it. Ah, here it is. I found it. I nonstop think about my OCD and I can't focus on the now. I'm always focusing on the, on how to beat my OCD. And then I refocus on what I'm doing. And then again, OCD makes me focus on OCD. Okay. Well, 
Jenna, you got an idea? I've got some ideas, but I'll let yeah, you Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's very normal when you start to implement some of these skills to get frustrated, that it, it doesn't work right away, right? Um, to, I, I hear from so many people, like we have a really great first psychoeducation session. I give them some practical tips, maybe session two, they come back and they're like, yeah, I tried that, but it, it, it just, I kept having the thoughts. I'm like, oh, my, I understand that. Like we can totally expect for that back and forth to take place for a little bit. Right. So I think this reminds me of how OCD is very much like a little toddler. So imagine that all of you guys, when it comes to your OCD, that you have been in the grocery store with my toddler. He loves donuts. My son, every time that we're at the store, he wants donuts. And because I'm a sucker, I usually give him what he wants, what he asks for, because I don't like saying no and I don't like him crying. <laughs> so I'm like, sure, let's go get donuts. So now no matter where we are, he demands donuts until I suddenly go to the pediatrician and the pediatrician is like, you need to chill on the donuts. Um, so next time I have a plan, my plan is to say no to the donuts. I can't expect my son to know that. I can't expect him to know, okay, cool. My mom is going to say no to donuts and I'm going to be okay with that. Same with your OCD. Your OCD, just because you learned about exposure and response prevention, your OCD is not going to be like, cool, peace. Got it now. I'm done. Your OCD is still going to ask for the donuts. Your OCD is still going to cause a fight. So OCD asks for donuts, just like my toddler asks, you know, said, gives you an intrusive thought or gives you a doubt or whatever. Now, all of a sudden your tune is different. You don't just give it what it wants by doing a compulsion. You say, no, I say, no, honey, we're not getting donuts right now. We, we have food at home. Again, he's not going to just back down and, and take it easy, right? Like he's going to be upset because he's not getting what he's used to getting. The, the tides have turned. He's not getting what he's used to getting and your OCD is going to be reacting that way as well. So your OCD is not getting what it wants. You've typically been reinforcing this intrusive thought or reinforcing this, this obsession by doing these compulsions. When you stop doing that compulsion, you're temporarily going to see an increase in that obsession. You're temporarily going to see an increase in that anxiety. It's called an extinction burst. And so when you guys resist a ritual and you try to not engage with it, but then it comes back, it's nothing more than a toddler throwing a temper tantrum. We can expect a toddler to do that. So we need to expect our OCD to do that as well. That doesn't mean that when my toddler freaks out at the grocery store and he's throwing a temper tantrum or he's hitting, that I freak out and say, okay, this isn't working. I'm just gonna give him the donuts. P.S. I totally do that, by the way. <laughs> um, but I've set myself, it, when I do that, like I've totally set myself up for failure for the next time, right? Like I've just demonstrated to my toddler, that's what you need to do for next time. In order to get it what it was that you wanted, that is the behavior that you need to reach. You need to hit, you need to scream, you need to X, Y, Z. So I've just established a whole new status quo for that behavior to be reinforced for next time. I've just made it harder for myself. And that's what you guys, that's what happens when you try to resist, you have that extinction burst, that temporary increase in your anxiety, and then you give in. That's how the OCD kind of gets worse over time. And so as difficult as it is, if what it is that we're wanting to do is to extinguish those associations and extinguish that learned behavior, meaning get rid of, you know, reduce that obsession, reduce that anxiety that we experience from that obsession, we're going to have to stay the course. You're going to have to, even when that temper tantrum is flaring, you're going to have to not give in with the donuts. You're going to have to, even when you feel that increase in guilt, when you feel that increase in uncertainty, when you feel that increase in anxiety and distress, you're going to have to continue to practice your skills. I'll add this. Okay, so OCD wants you to focus on it and you can't focus on them now. And yet, you typed this answer. You typed this question. And then you realized we hadn't answered the question. So you typed something else, which meant that you were focusing on the now because you were recognizing that we hadn't answered the question. So number one, I'd say you are able to focus on the now. Number two, even if OCD is telling you to focus on OCD, okay, here's your ERP. You ready? Continue to do the things that you need to do in your life anyway, even if OCD is telling you to focus on OCD. And over time, your OCD is going to realize, crap, 
this guy's accomplishing things, even though I'm telling him to focus on me. Now, then it's going to scream a little bit louder, and it's going to be like, hey, hey, well, you're not focusing on me enough. I want you to continue to do the things that you need to do as much as you possibly can. And eventually, OCD is going to say, well, crap. I've been trying to get all of his attention all this time. He's still doing things like walking, breathing, blinking, functioning. Hopefully, maybe school or work or whatever it is those types of things are that need to get done during the day. And when you do that and you show yourself, that, hmm, look at that, OCD screaming at me all day long to pay attention to it, and yet I'm still accomplishing things even though it's doing that. Maybe OCD doesn't have to be paid so much attention to. You're not going to not pay attention to OCD by trying not to pay attention to OCD. <laughs> that's just that's a weird sentence, but that's the way that it's going to be. There's no way to not pay attention to OCD by trying not to pay attention to OCD. That involves doing something, which all of us have our favorite, the pink elephant, right? The more you try not to pay attention to the pink elephant, the more the pink elephant is there with you, right? So, so that's not the way that we go. Instead, we just keep the pink elephant there. And after a while, we won't even really notice the pink elephant there. Or if we do, they'll be like, oh, yeah, there's a pink elephant there. Okay. And then I'm still going to go on anyway, answering my question and doing what I need to do, even though the pink elephant might even be like this and be like, yo, hey, what about me? And I'm still by hand here going, so, Jenna, anyway, I'm going to continue answering some questions and go do things, even though the pink elephant is trying to take up all the attention away from me and not allow me to do anything. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to do whatever I need to do, even though the pink elephant's there. And we are having the attitude that that pink elephant can either be there or it cannot be there. But we're yep. still going to go ahead with the live because we have a plan and right. we're moving forward. And we're moving forward because we're not going to let that pink elephant mm -hmm. ruin our experience, mm -hmm. even if it wants to grab all of the attention my son can either have a, he can have a temper tantrum or he cannot have a temper tantrum my goal is to listen to the pediatrician's advice and to not make my life hell next time and so what that means is i can't give him the donuts right now mm -hmm. yeah. let's see christian says uh, uh oh love lana says i like this uh, I've never had someone understand what happens with OCD until I met an OCD specialty therapist. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Christian says, Hey guys, I obsess over a chipped tooth that keeps chipping after I get it fixed. I obsess that the sharp edges will make it hard to talk or cut my tongue off. My life will be horrible unless I fix the tooth. Um, okay. So how many times has your tongue been cut off, Christian? I would ask that question, number one, by the sharp tooth. Um, and how hard is it to talk because you have a tooth that's chipping? Just curious. I mean, I, uh, I had a porcelain in this back tooth that popped out about six times before I finally just went to a different dentist and, and got a crown put on and said, um, would my life have been better worrying about when that porcelain was going to pop out again and my tooth would be sharp again? Or I got the porcelain in and then I lived my life until it popped out again. And then I went to the dentist and, and I did it. I'm wondering if I was missing something and I should have been worried about the sharpness of it and what would have happened to my tongue. Right? So, Christian, I say that to show you this. There are people who experience the exact same thing as you who don't do what you do. Right. So that says to me, here's the influence of the OCD. Right. Um, just because you obsess and maybe do compulsions by throwing your tongue over your tooth to see if it's really sharp and if it will cut it or anything, just because you have these obsessions doesn't actually mean that they have to interfere with your life because there are other people who have experienced this exact same thing and not have their life ruined by it. So the tooth is not the problem. The OCD is the problem. That is the true issue in this whole experience. The way that the OCD takes over this thing, the tooth in and of itself is just something that the OCD has picked up. That's it. Yeah. And ever since we've gone over this question, I find myself like running checking your teeth. teeth and, <laughs> yeah. My jaw kind of hurts. I must have mm -hmm. been clenching my jaw. Like, mm -hmm. If you're looking for something, this goes for everyone. If you're looking for something, you're going to find it. Absolutely. So we all have what's called a confirmation bias. We actively look for information to confirm what we already believe to be true. 
So, so, and you have that orientation of, you know, I need to look for threat. I need to look for any jagged, uh, jaggedness in my tooth. I need to make sure that, you know, I need to, I need to focus all my attention here. You're going to find something that's wrong. Yeah. Right. As opposed to going and living your life and trying to let that be kind of like a TV that's on in the background, but that you're not actively tuned into and you're not watching every single moment and you're not picking up every single word. It's it's on in the background and it can either be there or it cannot be there, but you're still going to do the things that you want to do. Absolutely. Well, Jenna, it's been a fun hour. Thank you so much. I it really appreciate really the time. Uh, next week we have Chris Tronson joining us. So I'm excited that he's going to, he will be here next week uh, to to talk and, uh, chat about and, and he's got a, a mini conference coming up in California as well too. The OCD SoCal. So we're going to talk about that and all sorts of things. So to all of you, thank you once again for joining us. We we appreciate it. Christian said we make sense in our answers. So Jenna, good job. We made sense tonight. Hey, we got some nice compliments. We got some good compliments. Yeah, I love it. I love it. All right. Well, everyone, be well. Um, stop listening to what your OCD tells you because it's a jerk and a bully and stupid and um, has never made anyone's life all that much better, as far as I can tell. But it sure has made people's life all that much worse. Mm-hmm. Till we meet again next week, everyone, have a great night. See you be later. challenging yourselves. Yeah.